So I think it, it, as we're running a little late, I'm going to invite him onto the stage now and thanks so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Simon. Um, it's a pleasure, of course, to be here. Today, I will, it's a lovely concert. It's a lovely conference. I'm having a great time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about thinking with our body and with other things. This is all part of the view that we are tightly embedded in uh, the world and that most of cognition is uh, a product of interacting with objects, mediated with objects, and closely coupled. Um, so, I see. Okay. This is an example of. So what, another question I would like to ask is really, how, does, uh, how do we move thought forward? Here is uh, the hand using a pacer. The hand is dragging the eye. It's a basic question. Why does thought move forward? What drives it forward? What I'd like to talk about today is how we use our eyes, hands, bodies, tools, and nearby objects to help us think. So the first thing I'd like to look at is thinking with our eyes. Will this design work? You look at it, and what do you see? You run a little narrative. So you, you uh, perhaps uh, imagine yourself picking, up, picking it up at the handle, tilting to pour it, simulating the lid falling, and perhaps simulating lid liquid leaking even if the lid remains, because as you see, it is, uh, it's higher than the spout. So um, that process you just went through, what is that? Which square becomes the cube's top? This mental visual, act, visual reasoning process you're engaged in. What, what is involved in that? So yeah, D is the top square. It's a form of mental simulation. These are some of the processes that we engage in when thinking, and they're not just discursive language processes. So some thinking involves mental simulation while you're looking. And this talk is a riff on that basic idea, that as creatures who know the world through sensing and acting and experiencing consequences, we make sense of things by recreating possible situations and probing them. We create perceptual narratives, and we think by doing. We have many flexible ways of actually changing the situation to help narrative construction. It's not hypothetical deductive reasoning. It's another process. So here's a, I would call mental simulation while looking, a type of projection. Where can the white knight move? Where can the white knight move? Can move there, can move there. How many of these can you do? And how much projection in total can you do? I mean, it's one thing to do it when all the chess pieces are out there. What about um, projecting what it would be like when the chess pieces aren't there? You can certainly project some pieces on the board. That's a form of projection. Now project their movements and look several states in advance. What kind of visual memory is involved in that? And what kind of visual processes are involved in that? All this is part of thinking. I'm sure we'd all agree that musicians think when they play music, sculptors think when they sculpt, painters when they paint, dancers when they dance, especially when they're being creative, as they are all the time. Uh, so we know that we think in many modalities. 
And uh, the challenge is finding an explanation of thought that enables us to understand how thinking can take place, even when it's not propositional. It's an understudied thing in this current time in our culture, and something that certainly deserves thought. So here's another. I'm, I'm going to be looking mostly at projection, but um, I, I'll, I'll present a whole thesis about this. Um, here's another example of projection and visual thinking. Move 11 to where 15 is. So you start with the visual search to locate the 11 and the 15. Then you kind of project a faint mental image onto the external, or you drop some internal visual anchors or indices on the items, and you work with that. Now I say move 1 to where 11 is. And how many moves can you reliably project? Okay. This whole process of doing a visual search to find something, then projecting onto the outside, using the outside structure to, you could call it scaffold if you like, but really it's something different. It's part of a visual processing system where you are adding, you're augmenting the visual stream early on in the perceptual process and working with that somehow. So it's a controlled process and it's part of perception. So first we engage in a little visual search to set things up, then we project onto the outside, and then when you can't do it any longer, because there's too many steps involved, you manipulate. So this process of projecting and then creating structure to enable you to advance your cognition through visual reasoning in this case, that's a core interactive strategy. The thesis, then, is that thinking often involves manipulating external structures appropriately coordinated with internal projection. Or you could say that it often involves internal projection appropriately coordinated with manipulating external structures. It's interactive and tightly coupled. What I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the talk, I'm first going to introduce a bunch of theoretical claims and then discuss a case study uh, with a uh, random dance, Wayne McGregor's uh, uh, own personal company and dance company in the UK. Um, talk about thinking through the body in that case. Then, think, then talk about thinking with um, musical instruments or instruments and then just draw some conclusions. So the main theoretical claims. First, thinking is often interactive. And uh, uh, although you experience the interactive nature of thinking already, I want to explore this a bit more. So how do we use our hands to think? I ask you, prove all three medians of a triangle always intersect at a single point. Can you do that just in your head? Now I'll remind you. A median is the thing from the corner that goes to the midpoint of the other line. It's not a bisector or something, so it's median. It goes to the middle point. And uh, so you say, okay, well, let's see. I'm going to conceive of a triangle, and I'm going to imagine it with medians. I can put that first one in there. I can put that second one in there. Can you be sure about the third one? It's a tough problem because uh, you typically make some mental image, first conceive of it, then imagine the structure if you can, but it's really difficult to get the um, precision on this level of projection. And the further out it goes, the more faulty your projection. So it's much easier if you make an external representation of the triangle and then uh, having conceived it, now you try to, to do your mental projection of the three mediums. But again, you can do two, but the last one is hard, so you come down to check it out. So the first claim is thinking is often interactive, um, and it, it involves this project structure, then create structure, and this goes around in a loop. First claim. Claim two, projection can be in any modality. Look and use your hands to feel the width of this block. So now, now, if you'd be kind enough, do this. Look at it and try to feel the width. If you actually do it and you're attentive and you feel the boundaries of the, the box, then you're doing some kinesthetic projection. You're anchoring your kinesthetic projection on the visual, but nonetheless, it is this kinesthetic thing. Read this silently. All right. Now, that's auditory projection. It's in your head, onto words. Those of you who have played uh, musical instrument, 
uh, or played music minus one, where they play for you, say, the Bach double violin, missing one violin, the first violin, and uh, you're listening to the piece, you know your part, you don't have to play the, 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 the violin in order to know, if you know your part, where you come in and you hear yourself playing it on top. That would be musical, that would be, again, an auditory projection on top of something quite different. <coughs> Plan two, so we project in many modalities, kinesthetic, sound, vision. Three, we create structure to project onto in many modalities. So if uh, some of you are familiar with mental abacus, Please. this boy, is, this young man is, is multiplying Please. two, seven, two, seven digits. Two. And you ask, why is he bothering with the hand motion? So there is either visual projection onto the hand motion as he sees the abacus in his mind, or kinesthetic projection onto his hands as he manipulates the pieces. And what's interesting about uh, this kind of uh, abacus, mental abacus it's called, is that you can't possibly do this kind of uh, multiplication in your head because it takes too long to say uh, 10,900,416. That takes way too long. So they don't encode it in auditory terms the way we do. They encode it visually in terms of what the abacus looks like. And then they manipulate the abacus. Maybe they're practicing, maybe it's for memory, but they're also uh, uh, thinking these things through. Simon mentioned Tetris, it's a long time ago since uh, we did that, but here uh, we think by moving objects. So I say, where should this piece go? And I'm going to assume all of you know Tetris, and it's a good bet because when we first started working in Tetris in the, in the early mid-90s, uh, people from Silicon Valley came down because it was the first arcade game, the first computer game that had more addicts who were women than men. And so they were quite interested in know why, what was it about Tetris? Um, so, uh, you know, the pieces come down quickly, tink, 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 and uh, you have to decide where to position the piece. We found that physical rotation is faster than mental rotation. You can physically rotate between 80 and 110 milliseconds, um, a quarter turn. Mental rotation is anywhere from 250 to 300 milliseconds. So you could do this much faster. And moreover, by physically rotating it, it particularly if it was a, an ambiguous piece where it could be a, a, a Z or an S piece, um, by physically rotating it, you disambiguate the piece. So people would rotate the pieces more than was necessary if they were ideally efficient. And they seemed, therefore, to have some kind of cognitive virtue because if you rotated it more and you were still already, you were, had become an expert already, then it couldn't be because you were just uh, uh, being wasteful. You would expect it to go down. When you become a super expert, of course, you know the pieces so well, you don't do any of this extra rotation. But there's this, this period all along until you become a really good expert that you continue to do it. So you're rotating it to reveal the pieces, and you also project the location down there in the bottom there. OK. <coughs> so um, uh, I ask you now, will these make this? Okay, will they make that? No. Now, uh, there is a, a closed, there's a, a closed form solution. By that I mean you could have counted the uh, out pouchings and in pouchings, and you would discover that there was an, uh, an extra in pouching. And so uh, there was an extra gap, and so they could never have, have worked perfectly. But um, if you didn't do that, well, the way you'd want to do it, of course, is manipulate the pieces. And if you manipulate the pieces in the world, you know it's guaranteed to be correct if you can do it. It's, a, it's an existence proof. It's a solution, a proof. It's reliable, it's usually faster, it's less effortful, and it scales up better. You might be able to do it with six pieces, but you certainly couldn't do it 15 pieces or 20 pieces. So this is something we do all the time, and it's second nature. We don't think much of it. So we create structure to project onto in many modalities. We, create it, we, we, we project onto our hands, we project onto sound, uh, and moving objects. Interim summary. We think interactively through projection and creation, 
And thinking often involves building models or simulations to make sense of things or to think things through. This interactive strategy is multimodal. It can be applied to gestures with mental imagery of projection of some sort of body movement, manipulating objects, writing, drawing, sketching, playing music, so many things. Next claim, four, interactive thinking requires a tight temporal coupling between internal and external processes. This is the thing that I'm, I'm currently working on most now. It seems to me it's the, the, the enormously neglected element of the uh, extended mind theory, which uh, too often looks like it's a dialogue where it's bouncing back and forth, step, step, step. But um, really, the nature of our coupling is usually continuous and far more interesting than that. So you'll notice in Tetris that if you were rotating it to identify the piece, it's really no good if you rotate it too late. And it's no good if you rotate it too early either. There's a just right spot when your mind is set to understand the implications of the rotation, to disambiguate the piece, to tell you which piece it really is. Here, um, many of you who are in depth recognize this as a typical kind of uh, method to improvise dance structure. In this case, uh, it is more rapid. performance, but it involves a tight temporal coupling between the components that he's uh, visualizing and the thing he's doing, because it certainly won't be uh, useful if he's thinking one thing and then he's doing it a little later. He wants to know the effects of his action on his imagery. So we have this tightish temporal coupling. Uh, uh, I say, read these words, and you read these words. Well, the way your inner speech works is tightly coupled to what you're looking at. I ask you to write something down where you're thinking something out. Um, you build on your writing interactively. The inner processes can't decouple too far from your outer ones. I mean, you can be a little behind in what you're thinking. Your writing is following your thought, but not very far. So you write, read, and write. It's an interactive process. And if in conversation, if there are delays of an inappropriate sort between individuals, the conversation breaks down completely. Claim four, then. There is a tight temporal coupling between the internal and the external. I've talked about mental imagery of some sort and movement. The mental imagery I'm talking about is this projection stuff, which is a special type of mental imagery. I'll distinguish them a little better later. Claim five, when we externally model, we mentally project to some aspect or dimension of the target thing. I don't expect you to get this right away. We'll come back to it when we talk about marking as an explanation of what happens in marking. But the idea is that um, when you uh, are thinking of these mental models, when you're making little inner simulations or models, you're doing inner narratives, you're not really doing it in the full resolution. So you make a caricature of some aspect of, of the thing you're interested in, and that's the thing. When you think of that uh, a teapot, you, know, you don't really see the whole way the head falls, the lid falls off the teapot. You see some sketch of the teapot head falling off. Models are simpler than the thing modeled, and we rely on that. So we use aspects. So when we mentally project, it's usually to some aspect of the thing that we're looking at. So those are the main theoretical claims. I want to go through some of them now and, and defend them a little bit. But mostly I'm going to look, look at things now in uh, the study we did on thinking through the body. So this is a kind of body-mediated cognition. And as you must have uh, uh, picked up already, a lot of the things that interest me has to do with the way um, our cognition is mediated by things. You know, mediated. You bounce off of it. You use it. You rely on its properties, but actually it's as close coupled to the outside, which is mediating the way our thought moves forward. So interacting with the outside enables our thought to move forward. So we studied dance making, and the way we did that was um, uh, Wayne McGregor 
after some discussions, we agreed to collaborate. I was delighted. It was completely fortuitous and opportune. He came to UCSD to see if he wanted to be the first innovator in residence at uh, one of our colleges. And he came and spoke to 25 scientists. Um, he counted me as a scientist. And uh, we hit it off very well. I went to London. There was a seminar. There was a workshop there. And uh, after that, we agreed to work together. I said, I'll make a class. You'll come down with random and, and make, your, make a new piece. I'll study it with the class. And that's what we did. So they came to UCSD for three weeks. And we set up a whole lot of cameras. Uh, then I went back to London when he made another piece. And I went back to London when he made another piece. I went back to London when he made another piece. Uh, in fact, I go back to London all the time. And um, I, I have no problem with that. Uh, so uh, at UCSD, we set up a whole lot of cameras around, including some on the ceiling. We had the students uh, sitting around. They were each assigned. Uh, they had to, they, 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 such a, a good class it was. Um, the students agreed to um, spell each other and, and be present the whole time, the whole five hours a day that they were making. And two students then were assigned, or two, sometimes three, students assigned were each dancer. And uh, uh, I would interview Wayne for an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. He usually gives one 45-minute interview to people. He was very generous with me. Uh, we became good friends. And uh, uh, so I learned a lot about how he thinks about his dance. Uh, and uh, so the dancers were out there, and they would take field notes. We developed a coding scheme. We timed things. We had descriptions. I interviewed Wayne all the time. And then um, we had this um, pressing and nerve-wracking thing where um, I would talk to Odette, the associate choreographer, just before the end, and I'd say, who would, who would be responsible for taking notes on exactly what Wayne was doing, because she's responsible for afterward rehearsing it with the dancers when Wayne isn't around. And so um, I'd say, Odette, what did he do today? And she would tell me exactly what she thought he did, which was, of course, accurate. And then we would have questions for our students who would sit down with the dancers, two students to each dancer, not usually as many as these, and they would interview the dancers. But we weren't interested in what the dancers had to say. We were interested in having the dancers dance their decisions. So often it would be tasks that the dancers would do, be performing, choreographic problems, solving a task. And they have to make decisions. And over time, they try one thing, and then they try another thing, and they decide one thing is better than another. And you don't know exactly why, but they can tell you, perhaps. And so that was the thing we were quite interested in. We collected a lot of data, about 20 terabytes of data, each one of these uh, activities. We had dozens of interviews. Lots of skills, dancer notes. We would take the notes of the dancers, some of the notes of Wayne, some of the notes of uh, Odette. Um, and uh, the students made notes, and we would also collect the music. So I'm not a dancer. I don't know anything about dance. Um, I, I, at least I didn't at the time. And about, I guess, three or four years ago, I said that in Wayne's company. I said, um, you know, I don't know anything about dance. And he was offended. He said, after all this time, that's, a, that's not polite to me. And so I try not to say that. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, each time I talk to him, I, I think I understand what he does. But um, yeah, I have no history of uh, uh, dance theory or, or knowledge of the history of dance. But I have good eyes. And the eyes that I have look at what people are doing and say, that's bizarre. <laughs> Why do people behave like that? <laughs> and one of the things that is bizarre, at least you can get in the mindset where you think it's bizarre, is marking. I mean, really? You can't dance like that later. And are you telling me dancing the wrong way now facilitates performance later? Why don't you dance full out? Oh, you say, well, you are going to get tired, or you could hurt yourself. That's why you don't dance full out. But how much can you learn from practicing in the wrong way? <laughs> so so um, this is supposed to play. 
Uh, that's a bore. All right, you've seen some marking already. Um, uh, what you'd see is Hannes over here, who, by the way, was brought in specially for the make, but never danced in the performances. It's just he's very good at this sort of thing. Um, he dances, and, and you could see that he's, he's really thinking as he's moving. He's, you could see he's thinking. And he's doing it much slower than usual. So what, what is marking? So marking uh, is, as I mentioned, uh, performing the phrase. It's originally from the phrase marking for time or marking in time. And there are a variety of ways of marking. People do it because they can get hurt, or they, they do two hours of bar or Pilates in the morning. Wayne comes then. Then they do five hours of dance. You just can't do seven hours like that, even in, when you're in top condition. <laughs> This is, uh, oh, I see, so they've been running up there. Uh, I ran into a woman uh, in LAX in the club, and we got to chat, and she said she was on her way to a Irish dancing conference. I said, no. <laughs> you know, I've been meaning to get a video of someone finger dancing, because they practice like this sometimes. Come on. <laughs> How can that, with the wrong digits, the wrong limbs, possibly facilitate performance? So marking is when you make an imperfect model of the real phrase. It's kind of like a sketch or an abstraction. Although the dancers do distinguish sketching from marking. So at least among the group of dancers that I'm acquainted with, they use sketching when someone's dancing a form that they have to copy, and then they're sketching it as quickly as they possibly can. And that's not marking it yet. They're first getting it. But once they know it, they know at least to some degree of resolution, they then can practice it by marking it. And when they mark, they seem to be tending to a specific aspect of a movement, and they practice these uh, uh, real phrases by marking. It's an absolutely universal phenomenon. This is tedious now. Um, uh, they, it's a universal phenomenon. People will practice their tennis phrase by marking. Uh, people will practice cello in the wings, marking. It's called doing it in Italian, or an Italian run through in theater, where you run to the position, and they go, bee, bee, bee. you don't say the whole words, you run to another position, and you try out the positions you're going to have on a new stage. Also getting familiar with the lighting. And it seems, uh, again, this aspectual, um, imperfect modeling. So uh, we see marking in a lot of places. Uh, in rock climbing, if you'll see, you go down there and you see people going like this on the ground before they go up. They're trying out their grips, but of course they're not really trying out their grips. They're pretending to do their grips. They're marking their plan. In the case of uh, uh, moguls, people at the top go down the mogul, and you see, you see them looking at the top before they, they might go like this, and they're moving their body around. That's a kind of small marking. And here's a moving to the side. Yeah. So, um, Je sais toujours mon canapé. Et on a le droit de cadence. Cadence est bien. Il faut pour un évitement. Évitement, on Et top, perche, perche. Et top. De neuf, la fumée top en dièse en jeu top. Quatre All right. So there's a lot of this stuff going on. And uh, there's also. Oh, this is extremely tedious. Um, there's also. Uh, marking for synchronized swimming.
Now here is uh, Antoine doing, so um, I wanted to study marking. So I asked the dancers, okay, please mark for me in full a piece of uh, uh, a phrase that you know. Um, and uh, so they did that. And then I asked them, please now mark it in the way you would yourself. Because when the dancers, when I first asked them to mark it, to show me the marking, they um, uh, got confused. Because for the choreographer, or for Odette, the associate choreographer, um, they have a very specific way that they want to see the, 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 the phrases marked if they're going to look at marking at all. They want it to be a full out extension to show the full pathway, the full, the full extension of the movements. But when they mark for themselves, they mark it differently. So I said, no, no, please mark it the way you would for yourself when no one's looking. And um, there are different ways you can mark them, medium size, or you can even have small marking. And so we had them uh, do this, where they marked it uh, medium full, and then they, then they, then they, then they danced uh, medium size. And uh, then they marked, then Antoine in this case marked it small. And in, in, in Antoine's case, um, he actually crossed his hands for a leg crossover one time. And once he put his leg up this high, I'm using my, I'm marking his leg. Uh, <laughs> he put his uh, leg up this high when he did the full out, then he put his leg that high when he did it for medium size. And the last one, where he just sort of went to indicate that. And that was sufficient for him. Okay. No media, but lots of microphones. <laughs> Two, three, four, five, so, six. So, oh, wait. Yeah. Full. That was full. Yes. So and here's the Agnes. And you would be one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not using energy, but I'm thinking, what's my pathway? Or All right. So Agnes was doing a, a full out there. And then uh, we asked I'm Agnes to. Tombe padure. I'm gonna do tombe padure. All right. This, this is, is a... the smallest one. Mm -hmm. This is a, the smallest one, and so um, she, she, uh, you saw. <laughs> so we ran an experiment to explore the value of marking, and to, to explore the value of marking, um, we thought, well, you know, we know that. Uh, lying on the floor, mentally simulating. We know that mental simulating facilitates performance in sports. So um, the way you practice normally is by practicing things full out. We know that simulation simulates. So marking, the conjecture was, marking is better than simulation. Not sure why, but it's at least, it ought to be as good as simulation because the, the idea is that you're simulating in your head anyway to some degree, but you're not actually simulating the are you simulating the correct thing? I don't know. So we, um, that was our assumption, that uh, full out would be better than um, marking, and marking would be better than mental simulation. And to explore this, um, we had a simple experimental design. We had Odette think up three 60-second phrases of about equal complexity, and she taught them a phrase, one phrase, in 10 minutes, a full one minute phrase, dancers, in 10 minutes. Then she measured them under a number of criteria. Then they practiced it, and they practiced it under different conditions in a second, I'll tell you. And then we measured after their practice to see how well they improved. The, uh, The criteria we used were uh, the precision, precision of positions, the completeness of detail for memory, the speed, force, and acceleration, which is dynamics, and of course marking doesn't encode dynamics particularly, and then timing, the tempo and duration. What we found was to our great surprise was that marking was better than full out and that simulation didn't even facilitate. So um, the simulation was rather disappointing, but it, the big surprise, of course, was that marking was better. 
And when we looked at the results on the definitions, that is under the particular criteria, um, memory was you know, strongly trending and uh, um, technicality, you can see marking is clearly better. Timing is trending and dynamics, it's not bad, but obviously it's not as good. And when you sum all of those together, so technicality is 0 0.0029, timing 0 0.01, so in fact it's significant, and memory, technicality, and timing is 0 0.018. So it's quite significant that marking was better than full out. You say, well, all right. So what is marking? It's a, it's a movement reduction system, and there are other movement reduction systems uh, that also might facilitate thought, like whispering or subvocalizing, gesturing, physical miming with objects. There are lots of these things. So now we want to know how does it work. Well, I mean, you know, you imagine it, and then you have to establish that your idea might work. So the simple idea was that um, marking provides this underlying dynamic scaffold or support that you could project onto. And what you project onto is the simulation, the, the, the big simulation of what you really are supposed to do, although not necessarily the entire thing. So projection is pretty central to the idea of marking. And projection it can be distinguished from imagination because in imagination you uh, don't spatially localize things. So imagine here we're looking at a tic-tac-toe board. In perception, you see the X's and O's on the board. It's reality-oriented, and you see what's there, at least you're supposed to. In projection, it's like augmented reality. You are anchoring imagery onto the board, but it's not really there. But you are tying it to a specific location. Whereas in imagination, it's like full virtual reality. You are imagining the board, and you're imagining the X's and O's on it. And how big is that? So it doesn't have any spatial location like that. And our claims from study, we started to study mental projection, and the idea was that it would be more powerful than mental imagery alone, that somehow having some external scaffold like that was going to be useful, and that you can project beyond what you can readily imagine because of that external scaffolding thing. In other words, external structure helps us some way, so we tried an experiment to explore this idea, and it was tic-tac-toe. And there were several, three conditions. There was the imagination condition, the projection condition, where you project the X's and O's onto here, and uh, an, another condition, which uh, uh, any good psychologist would have told you this would be a distractor, but in my ignorance, I thought, oh, well, maybe it'll save them a few bits so they'll have the X and O there present as well. Uh, so that was another projection condition. And uh, the, the way we're running the experiment now, again, after a few years, is turning the X's and O board on the side, slanted, to show that although it's got the same amount of structure, some external structures are good and some external structures are bad for projecting. And that means that if you design your HCI stuff or your external structures well, they do well. It's not just structure, it's got to be the right structure. So um, we have this tic-tac-toe game that you play, and you played it with an opponent, and we, we tracked it and see how well you do. And to play the game, though, since you couldn't see anything other than the stimuli, we trained you on the number. You had to learn how to call out the cell. So I say one, you say five, I say nine, and you play the game like that. So people had to reach criterion and performance of knowing the cells. Then um, uh, we, we uh, gave them these conditions. And I just want to say that projection in the, uh, is not the same as offloading because the outside state doesn't change at all. So you're not offloading anything. There's nothing there to offload. I mean, there's no state change. And what do we find? Well, what do you think? Wrong. So we did not find that projection facilitated. At least for 25 subjects, it did not uh, do any better. The X and O there was a little bit better than the other things, but essentially these are a wash statistically. So the table condition, that, the, that is the projection condition, was no faster than the blank page. In fact, there were a lot of people who positively disliked it. 
So look how much better the, pay, the blank page is, in other words, the imagination condition is, for over half the subjects than the table condition, which is the projection condition. Lord knows why they would force seven over there. But um, nonetheless, there was this big difference. Why would that be? Because there's an anchoring cost. You have to get the visual anchor, you have to anchor that image inside the perceptual stream. It's not free. Imagination is free in some sense, but this one is special. So are there ever cases where the benefits overcome the anchoring costs? Conjecture, if the task is hard enough, everyone's going to benefit. So we trained them on the 4 by 4 Not a particularly happy topic for the subjects. <laughs> Same as before, three con conditions. They took a lot longer to master the, the, the numbering. Thank goodness, everybody did better. And so, yes, in fact, quite a bit better. So the table is worth the cost of coordination in harder tasks. And the table was faster than in X and O, too, so it was a distractor. When we looked at the details, we gave everybody a VIVIC, a, visual, a vividness of visual imagery quotient test. Uh, it's, it's a survey test, but it's a, it's, a, it's a method of measuring how good you are as a visualizer. And just as you would expect, the weak visualizers over here, they did so much better than when they had the um, uh, grid. Lower is better, so they did so much better when they had the grid than when they had the blank. And the strong visualizers, they too did better, but not that much better. They're almost significant, but it's trending. But I mean, you could be certain that it's going that way. Altogether, everyone was better. You know how it works with these statistics. And um, uh, so, just as you would expect, the weaker your visualization system, the less hard the problem has to be in order to benefit from good external structure. So the upshot with respect to projection. Um, it's a real process. It's distinct from perception and imagination. As problems get harder, when it's hard to imagine the answer, we rely on creating external structures to project onto and to scaffold our imagination. So claim six, if we can think with our, oh, okay. That was the end of that claim back there. That was all about that projection stuff. Claim six, if we can think with our bodies, then we can think with things that we are highly practiced with. Huh? Huh? Okay. So let's look at this. I'll be quick. Um, so I would like to now look at the way we think with tools in this case, because it's more pleasant. Let's think about musical instruments. So we know that players can mark with their instruments. So if that's the case, um, uh, they can think with their instruments if marking is a kind of thinking. And we know that instruments uh, can be absorbed into the body schema. Uh, there are lots and lots of tests of this. So we know that in some sense the, body, the uh, instrument is like an extension of the body. But you know, there's a bow and a violin. It's a lot more than just extending the arm with a rake or something like that, so it's big. Um, so we say that the experts can probably think with their instruments, and I think you'll grant me this, just grant me this, because you're believers anyway, and, um, <laughs> but, but grant me this. So the question really is, can they have the same thoughts without the instrument? That's the question. Okay, do you really need the violin to have those thoughts that you have when you have a violin? So here's why you might think they could have the same thought without playing. telling me he's not playing too? Really? So we think that uh, if you're a super expert and you play enough, eventually you can simulate playing without an instrument in your hand through internalization because basically you're never 
without the instrument in your hand as far as your mind is concerned. That's just about the base state. So this is instrument-mediated cognition, and it ought to be possible without the instrument because you're so oriented to the instrument. And his auditory perception is so expert. When he listens, surely it's as if he's physically playing. And the, inner lis the listening triggers some inner simulation. And there's plenty of neural support that observation, in this case listening, would be enough, or visual would be enough, because of motor resonance, mirror neurons, action observation network, whatever you want to call it, those mirror neuron things. And mirror neuron things, they, it's the easiest way to understand mirror neurons is to suppose that uh, each action, motor action that you perform, consists of two parts. There's a covert part, which is all the motor preparation and the ready-to-go part, and then there's the actual triggering of muscle movement that is the overt part. And you could have the, you should be able to dissociate the covert part from the overt part. And if you can, then maybe when you see somebody moving, that that triggers in you the covert motor preparation as if you were doing it yourself to some degree. So that's uh, um, the, the difference uh, between covert, overt, and mirror neurons are covert actions, it's thought. So we think that experts ought to be able to simulate playing covertly. And you get some support from this from an act of perception, which it really is, is, is a sort of uh, uh, the way that I think uh, Andy Clark, I haven't read his new book, but I'm sure he thinks of it this way in predictive coding, where uh, in an act of perception, when you see something, you see it as if you were looking at it in all the ways that you could look at it, including moving, modulated by your interests. So, um, <laughs> so uh, in auditory perception, agents enact a possible future. But what resolution do they enact that possible future? That's an empirical question. But we also know that familiarity surely makes a difference. So knowing a piece ought to enable better set of predictions and further out than not knowing a piece. So Yitzhak Perlman knows all those pieces so well, but suppose it was a new piece. He surely would experience some sort of mirror neuron effects from watching the violinist play and feeling the motions, but he couldn't anticipate the forms of preparation necessary for the entire next phrase, whereas if he's played it, he's going to be in that state of motor preparation too. And, Look at how physical modern performance is. Didn't always used to be, but it is very physical now. And it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, people like it more. So, uh, we're running a little late. I'd love to listen to. Uh, so, the performer situation is a little different than the observer situation. And especially because the performer has a responsibility to succeed. The performer must decide how to attack a note, its mood, its emotionality. But those concepts are ad hoc. I mean, um, how you attack a note at this particular moment depends on exactly the context you're in. And so it's situated and it's embodied by the whole physical state that you're in. And that's unavailable even to an expert observer because they're not, they haven't got the responsibility and they're not in the same physical state. So agents um, project a future that's conceptually and experientially richer as performers than the future that would be projected by an observer. Simulation is a lower resolution than actually playing. So I would conclude that with respect to instrument-mediated cognition, you get something extra for having the instrument in your hand and working with it, even when you're a super expert. But when you're not a super expert, you get a lot more. Because the, 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 the physical 
properties, the way it moves, the way it works, the way you work with it, are helping you to play the violin, which you couldn't really do if you weren't, uh, uh, didn't have the violin in front of you if you weren't super expert. So, my conclusions. Thinking is multimodal. We think with our bodies, we think with things, we think with our eyes, we think with our hands, and we think with kinesthetics. It's highly perceptual. There's visual probing and visual thinking. There's kinesthetic probing and kinesthetic thinking. It usually involves projection. The inside and the outside processes are tightly coupled temporally. It often involves physical or mental simulation or construction, both, often. Simulation and projection are, are often difficult, so interacting is usually part of the thinking, and we can do this through eye-hand mediated cognition, body mediated cognition, tool mediated cognition, representation mediated cognition, object mediated cognition, and more. And with the right external structures and movements, we can push thought forward faster, deeper, stronger. And what's my proof? In 51 minutes and 32 seconds, you have seen 165 slides. <laughs> Thank you.